Hello, it's Lee Richardson with the Brain Performance Center, and we are going to get in your head today with some great information. I'm sitting in the room with two very passionate people. One is an advocate, and one is an expert in the eating disorder community, and they come at this with such unique stories. I'm going to start by having Stephen introduce himself. Lee, thanks. It's so good to be with you again. Uh, I'm St- Stephen Dunn, the founder of the Morgan Foundation. Founded it uh, two years ago after my daughter lost her life to, uh, in October 2016 after fighting eating disorders for seven long years. So that just kind of put me on the uh, path that I'm on now. And along the path, I've been able to meet some incredible people including the doctor we have with us today Um, she's one of the most uh, renowned research doctors not only here in the United States but internationally as well so we are so blessed to have her with us Lee so um, and that is Dr. Cynthia Bulick from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill so you've been in this business for an awful long time well, from since 1982. Yeah, that's and, about right, yep. And what you've learned, the little bit that you've shared with me is amazing. Because my exposure to eating disorders was really more from the anxiety or the depression standpoint. And just a little bit of uh, time I've spent with you, I've learned that that is, there's so much more. And I'm so excited because I think I know a little, and I think, you know, you know a lot, and we all need to learn so that we know how to deal with this. Because mental illness, this May is Mental Illness Month. What a great show to have. One out of five adults in the United States will suffer from a mental illness in any given year. Worse, one out of five between the age of 13 and 18 will suffer. So it's something that we need to be aware of as friends, parents, just in the community. And so I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks for having me today, Lee. So what got you into the, to studying this? Well, interesting that you should mention that you know it from the depression and anxiety standpoint, because that's actually where I started. So my original research was in childhood depression, um, and my supervisor asked me to write a chapter comparing anorexia nervosa and depression. And this was back in 82. Um, I didn't know much about eating disorders at all at that point. They weren't talked about much. And um, in order to write that chapter, I read everything I possibly could about anorexia, and I shadowed the attending psychiatrist on the unit in Pittsburgh, just so I could really get a sense of who these people were and what they were suffering from. And, you know, back then, it was a very different world. Um, And people thought that families were to blame and that it was a socioculturally caused illness, you know, rich white girls trying to lose weight. None of that looked like anything I saw in the unit. So there was a real disconnect between what I was reading and what I was seeing when I worked with the people on the unit in Pittsburgh. Well, you know, it's interesting because what I find, most people think of mental illness as a personal failure. Mm. And it's not a personal failure. And I think that's what you were ta- what you saw in the unit. And that inspired you to do deeper study? Well, you know, saying that mental illness is a personal failure is like saying diabetes is a personal failure. Um, personally, I don't draw that line between mental and physical. I mean, I think that actually gets us into a lot of trouble in a lot of different ways because we're physical beings. Everything that happens, our thoughts are physical. You're so right. And everybody is so worried. Oh, I got to go to the gym because I might have a heart attack. And oh, I got to, you know, watch the sugar because I might get diabetes. But nobody stops and thinks about, oh, am I taking care of myself? You know, do I check in with myself ever? You know, because sometimes asking yourself, are you okay, Lee? And then you're saying, well, yeah, you know, or no, I'm not. And I think that's what I've seen with a few people, and I've known some people, I've worked with some people with eating disorders. They are so reluctant to ask for help. How do you reach out? 
Well, it's an interesting question because a lot of people with eating disorders don't think they're ill. Um, back in the, the last set of diagnostic criteria we had, denial of illness used to be something that they talked about. Um, but it really isn't so much denial. I think it's important to know that people with anorexia especially actually feel better physically when they are ill. So at baseline, they're very anxious people and starvation actually calms them biologically. So when we're helping them, when we're, help, when we're refeeding them, when we're getting them well again, it actually it, it doesn't feel good. And that's different than other illnesses. You know, when you, when you have depression, you go to your psychiatrist and say, please take this terrible mood away. But we're taking something away from them when we treat anorexia that actually makes them feel calmer within their sort of turbulent biology. Doctor, you know, and in fact, along the, those lines, uh, about a m month and a half ago, I helped get a young lady into a, a treatment center here in town, got the chance to talk to her and her mom right before she went in, and she's in wheelchair at the time, in really bad shape. And she said, Steve, it, it, it hurts to eat, though. And most people don't have haven't been able to connect the dots and take that pain they feel. They, they I'm sure they most people look upon it as, oh, it's in their heads or it's 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 a a, a fake pain. But with her, it was it, it 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 hurt her both her stomach, her throat, and in her head to eat. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's the kind you have to have respect for the illness and for the person who's suffering in that sense and listen to them. You know, the, the worst thing is when someone says to someone with anorexia, why don't you just eat more? Um, or tells a parent, can't you just feed your child more? Or the opposite, someone who has binge eating disorder, which is the eating disorder where you eat large amounts of food and feel out of control when you're eating, to tell that person, why don't you just stop, is in complete denial of the fact that this is an illness and they can't help it. They need help to order in order to eat more or in, eater, in order to eat less in the terms of binge eating disorder. You know, you make a really good point because most people, when you say eating disorder, they just think of one type, mm. anorexia. You know, that's, they just won't eat. And I think you mentioned there are like three or four. Right. So let's, let's talk about the topography of eating disorder. So anorexia we talked about, that's the one, like you said, people lose a lot of weight. They're very thin most of the time, although not always. So we have this new category now, atypical anorexia nervosa, where they have all of the features of the disorder, and they might have lost a lot of weight, but they're still in the normal or overweight range. Um, but their bodies are still starving. Second is bulimia nervosa, where people have binge episodes where they eat large amounts of food and feel out of control, and then they couple that with purging, either self-induced vomiting, laxative use, excessive exercise. But then the what most does that do to the gut? Oh, it's, it's terrible. It's disruptive. In fact, you know, on our unit, the most common con consults that we call are the GI docs because, you know, gastrointestinal problems are rampant in people with anorexia and bulimia. And then the third eating disorder, the most common one, is binge eating disorder. And that's that binge eating behavior, but in the absence of any kind of purging. And so often, but not always, that's associated with being overweight or obese. You know, you made an important, an important point in that um, the eating disorders knows everyone, not just one age or one ethnic group. It, it touches everyone. That's right. All the myths are wrong. And, you know, I've spent my career busting myths. Um, I published a book a bunch of years ago called Midlife Eating Disorders just to open people's eyes to the fact that people don't grow out of this illness. You know, we see a lot of people in middle age and beyond who have all of these eating disorders. In fact, one of the things I was talking about last night, an event that we had, that you also see eating disorders in the geriatric population. And that's often very overlooked. But if you just look at care facilities, there are all sorts of problems. And interestingly, laxative abuse is one of the biggest ones um, because that continues, you know, that's something they hand them out like candy mm -hmm. um, in some facilities. And that can become, you can become addicted to those just like you can with other substances. So you've done some pretty interesting research that really kind of peels the onion. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So my work has really spanned the gamut all the way from animal research to clinical trials to twin studies to population studies. But the main thing that we're focusing on now is the genetics of eating disorders. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to put together environmental risk factors and genetic risk factors to see how they interact because we know that both play a role. 
But most importantly, we know that genetics influences all three of those disorders. In fact, about 50% of liability to anorexia is due to genetic factors. But what we're doing now is actually digging deeper, and we're doing genome-wide association studies to figure out where on the genome those differences lie between people who have the illness and people who don't, and what those genes actually do. Well, I understand you're going to get a little edgy (laughs) about that. (laughs) Well, I like when my research is on the edge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So what Lee is referring to is our next big initiative is the Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative, which is edgy. Um, And what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to get DNA from 100,000 individuals with eating disorders as well as controls, Um, so people who've never had an eating disorder in their life, so we can compare them. So what we do is we get, we look at the genome collectively of all the people with the illness and compare it to the genome of all the people without the illness and see where on the genome those differences lie. And that really is the key to sort of discovering the genetic architecture of the illness. Okay, so, Doctor, when you do when you do that, though, the problem that I've seen that a lot of research has is you come up with these fabulous ideas, and then you draft these papers, and then they fall into the gap, and nothing occurs. From a practical standpoint, how are you going to take your work? What is that going to mean to the counselors and treatment centers and doctors out there who treat this insidious disease every day? I have a couple answers for you there, Stephen. So one of them, really interestingly, is I've been working with a genetic counselor, um, Janine Austin, who's up in Vancouver, and we just wrote this paper about what genetics means for clinicians. How can you use this in your practice now? And genetic counselors do amazing work, um, but generally they've been working with diseases that have sort of a Mendelian pattern, like if you have the illness, there's a 50% chance that your child has the illness. But they have now moved into the psychiatry sphere And we're working with them because so many moms are coming to us and saying, I had an eating disorder. Should I have kids? How how big is the risk for my children? And so now we're engaging the genetic counselors now to explain how complex this pattern is. It's not a chance type thing like that. There are, you know, genes are involved, environment is involved. You get this mixture, this soup of risk. And, you know, we can't change the genes at this point but we can buffer our children as much as possible. Um, And we know if someone is at increased genetic risk, they might be particularly targeted for targeted prevention efforts um, because that's really important. I'm gonna give you the second piece, and that is that all of this genetic work that we're doing, it's not gonna fall through the cracks. Hopefully what it's gonna allow us to do is identify those underlying biological pathways that lead to the illness, that make it hard to eat that make someone's body weight get pulled down to such a low path, and then hopefully be able to develop therapeutics that can actually target the biology of the illness. So that second piece doesn't happen right now. It's gonna take a while. We're gonna have to get our pharmacology friends involved, but that first piece can happen immediately by getting genetic counselors involved. Now, we're, now we're down here in Texas, which means we like our sports. Um, now, I know you have a very unique background as it pertains to sports. I wonder if you could go into that a little, a little bit and talk about how a- athletes are impacted by this as, as w- well. Sure. So what Stephen's referring to is the fact that um, I'm a figure skater, have always been a figure skater. I'm an ice dancer. And when I got into this field back in the back in 82, and then looked back on my skating colleagues, I realized that so many of them had sort of started losing weight, and then they just disappeared from the rink. Nobody talked about it then, but it became perfectly clear that they had succumbed to eating disorders. In fact, I had this one friend who, whenever we went over to her house, her refrigerator was padlocked closed. And when we were hungry, it was just a thing where we knew we had to ask her mom for the key so we could get some food out of the refrigerator. And then finally, mom, my mom, who's a pretty amazing person, asked her mom, why is your refrigerator locked shut? And she said, because if I don't, my daughter will eat everything in the refrigerator and then throw it up. This was years before bulimia was even a word, before it was discovered. So this has been around for so long. And I think this is probably part of what drew me into this field, is my academic interests and my sports interests sort of collided um, in the eating disorder space. And, you know, Sports don't cause eating disorders, but they sure can exacerbate them. 
you know, and I think about some of my kids' coaches, because all my kids coached as well, and we had some, you know, former Soviet Union coaches who would say things like, you know, when we competed, all we needed was cigarettes and coffee. Um, and I'm like, do you know whose daughter you're talking to right now? Um, but that kind of mentality can just Absolutely. be so damaging. And, they, and the nicknames that, you know, my nickname was Lead Bottom, and my best friend was Thunder Thighs. And what does that do for body image? It's terrible. Um, so what does sports that do to is your risk. mental health. Oh, well, yeah, it's not good. I mean, if you're robust, you can deal with it. But if you're vulnerable, it absolutely. sticks with you forever. And you get that negative self talk. Yes. You know, you hear that thunder thighs, lead bottom. You hear that over and yep. over and over. Yep. And, it, you know, you, you bring up some really good points. The, what I'd like to just, if you could, sp- spend a little bit of time talking about is if you have a child mm-hmm. or a friend that you think has an eating disorder. I mean, you can't tell them to eat more. No. You can't make them eat more. What can you do to help them? It's so interesting because people, it's easier for them to talk to a loved one or a friend about alcohol, about depression, about suicide, about sex. The hardest thing for people to talk to their friends and loved ones about are eating disorders. It's really interesting. I mean, we've even seen in medical school, before I went to UNC, there was a medical student who died from anorexia the year before I got there. Everybody knew she had anorexia, but nobody talked with her about it. And what I always tell people is you need to approach people with firm compassion. You need to understand that the behavior is driven by enormous anxiety. And what you have to convey is your deep concern for the person's welfare. And there's a chance that they're going to get really angry with you. But the alternative, as unfortunately we know, could potentially be death because anorexia has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder. So approach with firm compassion, tell them you're concerned about them, and the most important first step is to get a comprehensive evaluation. You know, sometimes people are afraid if you get a referral to a psychologist, that means that you're going to be in therapy for your entire life. Um, and you might take your loved one in for an evaluation. I don't care if it's to a dietitian who understands eating disorders, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, but someone who's going to do a comprehensive eval and let you know where things stand and then make an appropriate referral. And if there's nothing wrong, if there's nothing wrong, then at least you have a baseline. And if things do get worse, you can compare it to that baseline. But isn't that also an I- issue, though? We know, for example, in the standard three-year uh, me- medical school curriculum, on average, our young doctors are getting one hour of training on eating disorders. So as a result, we have a tremendous number of doctors, counselors, who don't, n- are, do, don't know about the disease, don't understand it, misdiagnosis, you know, what can people do to make sure that the people they go to actually know what they're ta- talking about? Yeah, unfortunately, I think most physicians learn more about eating disorders from People magazine than they do from their medical school curriculum. Which is, there, is, is there a website? Is there an organization yes. nationwide? Yes, so UNC has actually just been named the National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, and our job Um, is to train clinicians of all sorts and educators and trainers in evidence-based information about eating disorders. That website is nced or n-c-e-e-d-u-s dot org and over the next five years we're going to be rolling out our information resource center as well as online trainings. So we're going to teach primary care physicians how to do an eating disorders eval. We're going to teach trainers how to approach athletes and ask the right questions. And we're going to teach evidence-based psychotherapy skills to clinicians. And that is our mission. This country has needed that for so long, and we are so honored to be the seat of this new center of excellence. That is an honor. And that's something that I think we can attribute to your efforts and the energy that you've put into figuring it out. Because you just don't talk about eating disorders. You know, nobody talks about that. Nobody wants to admit it. Nobody, yeah, oh, well, they eat enough. Don't worry about it, you know. Well, but, so, but, but men really don't get, you know, boys and men really don't get this disease, though. It's just women thing. Really? Isn't it? 
oh, Stephen, <laughs> how wrong you are. Um, and, and I think this is one of the mantras that we all need to hear over and over again. Eating disorders don't discriminate. They don't care what sex you are. They don't care how much money you make. They don't care what color you are or what your ancestry is. They strike anyone at any time. Statistically, we see more women with anorexia and bulimia, but in part, that's because those diagnostic criteria were built around female cases. If we change the definition to, a com to include other sorts of things like abusing steroids to get more muscular or being more focused on your body fat rather than your body weight, all of a sudden you start seeing the number of male cases going up. So physicians have to have it on their radar screen at all times. Not only physicians, but counselors. Mm, absolutely. You know, I'm, I think, look, look at myself, and I hate to tell you how little I, I know about it. Particularly, now I know brain waves are genetic. They're just as genetic as anything else. But I didn't know that eating disorders were genetic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so for someone like myself, how do I educate myself? Well, going to nc.org, ncus.org okay. is going to be a great place. And okay. that, that, what you just said is precisely why we're there. Okay. Um, because we want to make sure that clinicians who might not be eating disorders clinicians have the basic tools. You know, because all of us, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, you know, and I know how to evaluate depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, whatever. But even in clinical psychology training programs, lots of people never get that basic training in how to evaluate an eating disorder. So we want to make sure it's at your fingertips and, and everyone can learn for free. And everyone means everyone. Everyone. Anybody can go to that website exactly. and look at that, exactly. that information. Yeah. That is is amazing. Right. It's got to, and it's got to be free because when you charge hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands of dollars to learn how to do an intervention, people can't afford that and they can't take time off of work. But if it's on the web and if it's archived and they can do it in their fluffy boots and pajamas, that's the way to teach people. Well, you just signed me up <laughs> when you said fluffy boots and pajamas and my puppies beside and your puppies, me. yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it is truly amazing. And when you look just in general, how, how many people suffer from eating disorders? So the number, the estimate in the states is around 10 million. Um, but the actual prevalence estimates about 1% for anorexia, about 2% for bulimia, and 3.5% for binge eating disorder. That surprises yep. me. So altogether, about 5% of the population probably has an eating disorder at some point during their life. Is, well, you say at some point during your life, do because I can hear I can hear clients say, "Oh, well, she'll outgrow mm -mm. it." No, 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 no. Um, that's actually a really important one. Um, so many people will say that they think it might be a passing phase. It is not. If we see someone who comes in with subthreshold symptoms, you know, they don't quite meet a diagnostic criteria. The next time we see them, it's much more likely that they're going to have a full-fledged full disorder rather than those symptoms having evolved. So it tends to go up and get worse rather than go down and resolve. So don't close your eyes. No And way. hold your breath. Stay and vigilant. Ho and hope it's going to go away right. because it's not. No. So just as we wind down and we close, as a mom, I raised two boys, and I'm sure I'll have grandchildren at some point. What if what would I see in my home? What would I see that would make me stop and think, Lee, you may have a problem. Do you want to answer some of that, Steve? Oh, yes. You're, you're going to find that whether it's a boy or a girl, they start to isolate themselves more. They start to, the friends they had, they start to push away from mm -hmm. because in their head, their eating disorder becomes their best friend. Uh, when you eat meal with them, you notice that they might push the food around a little bit. And right after they eat, they excuse themselves to go to the bathroom, of course. Um, they might eat at strange times of the day and strange combinations of food. But it's more, I think it's more, it manifests itself in their personalities and how they look upon themselves and their friends. Um, and the one thing that you know, I've said, the number of talks I've, I've, I've got to give, excuse me, that, well, that sounds got really, to got, oh. got to give. Um, I tell people in schools, if you believe you have a friend who's afflicted with this disease, talk to the counselor at school, talk to their teachers, talk to their mom and dad. You're not going to be rat, ratting them out. 
you could be saving their life. You know, and that comes from your heart. I know it does because I know I know the Morgan story. And if any of you want more information, you can visit the morganfoundation.org and and learn more about what Stephen has been through. And as you go, you know, as you now I hope we've opened some eyes. That's really what I hope from as a result of this podcast is we've opened some eyes. And if nothing else, people are starting to understand it's a problem. It's an issue. It's they're not going to outgrow it. It's not going to go away. They need help. And the but what I heard you say is be compassionate. Reach out. Put some effort there. So I, I thank you both so much for being here today. And I'm going to go. I'm going to go to that website. And for those of you that can't remember it, you know, just Google eating disorder UNC. Anything else that that they should Google? And if you Google the National Center of Excellence for Eating Disorders, that will get you up to that resource library that we have. That is excellent. And, you know, it's in May is Mental Health Month, so I encourage you, you know, there's a lot of good information out there. There's the National Alliance of Mental Illness, NAMI. Go to that website, look and see, educate yourself. You know, don't just stay, don't just stay worried about your physical health. Start to worry about your mental health.